Hi, this is Rich Allen Bogan, Chair of Neurological Surgery at the University of Washington, Director of the University of Washington Neuroscience Institute and Residency Director. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Rich Ellenbach, Professor and Chair of Neurosurgery at the University of Washington and also Director of the UM Medicine Neurosciences Institute. In addition, he is Director of the Neurological Surgery Residency Program and Founding Co-Director of the Seattle Sports Concussion Program. He is currently a member of the ACGME Residency Review Committee for Neurological Surgery and President of the Society of University Neurological Surgeons. He also has served as Chair of the American Board of Neurological Surgery, President of the American Society of Pediatric Neurosurgeons, and President of the Congress of Neurological surgeons. His numerous areas of clinical expertise encompass both pediatric and adult congenital neurological surgery, endoscopic brain surgery, brain tumor surgery, and neurotrauma care. He was a volunteer co-director of the NFL Head, Neck, and Spine Medical Committee from 2010 to 2017. Dr. Ellenbogen also served as commander of the 252nd Medical Detachment KE team during Operation Desert Shield Storm and was awarded a Bronze Star for his service. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Rich Ellenbogen, Chair of Neurosurgery at University of Washington. Doc, how are we doing today? We're doing great, thanks for doing this. Thank you for being with us. So as you know, the purpose here is really focusing on the graduating Chief Presidents and Fellows. So thinking back and starting out, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency? Well, um, during my residency and I trained in Boston, um, I was a first generation physician. So I just felt lucky every day that I got to do what I, I do. And I got to tell you, to this day, I haven't forgotten that. And I wake up every morning and can't believe someone actually pays me to do this. And so I, I, I've tried to, as a resident when I was young, uh, try to save a life every day, uh, do something good for somebody. And then I try to learn one new thing every day. One of my mentors said, don't ever leave Every day you are in the hospital, you do a lot of scut work. Don't ever leave without learning one new thing a day or changing, you know, helping one person. So I, I think that's kept with me. And um, uh, my fact, my residents still say I'm the best damn intern on the service. I, I joke about that because I have that intern mentality uh, about uh, humility and ability to, uh, uh, to help people. And I, feel very lucky that I get to do that, that's all. Now, taking us through your chief year, what was your mentality heading into your first job search and how that perspective changed the beginning years of your career? Well, so just for full transparency, um, I joined the army before I was uh, a physician and so I had a long payback. So my first job was in the army and it was easy. They just sent me orders and I showed up at Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center. Having said that, when I got out of the Army, that was my first civilian job opportunity. And I think the way to go about that, when I tell my residents is, I say, use your imagination, okay? People get in a mindset where they have to be on the east or west coast or they have to be in this city and their life will not be any good unless they make this much money or they work uh, at this location. And I learned that um, you have to throw that all to the wind. Uh, you go after the best opportunity. Where are the best mentors? Your first job, you need great mentorship. You want to be where a place that maybe you've never been before and reinvent yourself. And so I tell people to get rid of their conventional thinking and be open to, to a place that they would never go to. And so my first job I, um, after the army, I ended up in Seattle. And in a thousand years, you couldn't have predicted that because I grew up in, the, in New York Okay, and then I trained in New England. I was there for 15 years, and there was just no way I was ever going to leave that until my wife said to me one day, why don't we try something totally different? Why don't we go to the left coast, and, uh, and you just reinvent yourself, and I think that's the best advice I can give people. Think outside the box for your first job and look for opportunity. It may not be the place you dreamt about, when you were a resident, 
but it may be the best opportunity you ever get. Now, throughout your career, did you ever consider going private practice or are you academic focused all the way? You know, um, I liked research. One of the, th the three things that I really liked is I love taking care of patients. I, I liked research. Every time I had an idea of how I can change something, I wanted to go uh, and run a study or go to the laboratory and do that. And the other thing, the best part of my job is I, I'm also the residency director at the University of Washington, and I could give up almost everything, but I will not give up the interaction with the residents because they teach me a lot more than I ever teach them. I don't tell them that. Uh, every day, but um, I think the best part of the academic job is training the next generation, and the students always surpass the mentors, so that part I like. Now, having said that, uh, most of my closest friends in neurosurgery are in private practice, so I, I really respect what they do, wake up every morning and do this by themselves, and certainly in academics, there's an advantage of having residents uh, that are one step in front of you for uh, call call needs. Uh, but having said that, I've always thought about academics just simply to train the next generation. And also I have a laboratory, I have an active laboratory that's funded. And so uh, that's, that's kind of a fun part of the job. Speaking of your journey, can you kind of briefly take us through how you end up being the chair of the neurosurgery department? Well, it's a great question. So as I told you, I didn't grow up uh, as a first, I'm a first generation doctor and I couldn't afford to go to medical school. And when I got into college, uh, my dad, a World War II veteran said to me, how are you going to pay for that? And I said, well, I, I have no idea. He said, well, why don't you do what I did when I was 16, join the military? And I think I, uh, I think I pissed him off because he was a Navy guy and I joined the Army um, out of spite, I guess, um, uh, even though we're still very close. And um, I, um, I learned a lot in the Army. You know, most people don't do that route, but I learned, a, you know, I, I spent time in the Airborne and I spent time with soldiers and I, I learned a, a lot of things about leadership watching um, military people lead, you know, great leaders. I saw good leaders, terrible leaders, and I saw really great leaders. And so um, the unique thing was um, I ended up being the chief of neurosurgery at Walter Reed, and then I was recruited to the University of Washington. As I told you, that'd be the last place I would go because I'm an East Coast guy. I'm now a West Coast guy, and I probably will never leave. And, um, and then opportunity came up and it's not something I planned on. Uh, my uh, chairman, my predecessor uh, resigned and th th during a very tumultuous time at the University of Washington. And uh, um, I was the acting chair. And as a result of that, I ended up being the uh, chair and, um, and I was drafted by my fellow faculty and the residents at the time to be the chair. And, um, and it was really, it was an accidental adventure. Let's put it that way. It wasn't something that I planned in my life. I was happy doing what I was doing at every stage I was doing it. But one of my great aspirations was, and I have to be the chair at the University of Washington. I was just, I was just happy being a neurosurgeon, and I still feel that way. Throughout your journey, what would you say were some of the keys of your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of the academic industry? Well, I, I, I think the things that you've got to do to be successful is one, you got to surround yourself with people you love. At, at the end of the day, I, I, no one gets to the stage of their careers where they do what we do unless there is a strong family support. And that I had. I, uh, my wife is an ICU nurse. She still practices. And um, and she did most of the raising of the children, um, and it was real. It was a partnership, ninety nine percent her, one percent me, and um, and I think to be successful, you've got to have a, a great family life, and you have to have friends, and you surround yourself with friends. The other thing I tell people, besides family and friends, is mentors. 
uh, my first job out um, uh, when I was in the army, I had an ama- I had amazing mentors. I had incredibly skilled. I had this this one guy from University of Rochester who was a brilliant surgeon, could do anything. Probably the best surgeon I've ever seen in my life. You you probably haven't heard of him, but I hung around him and he would kind of mentor me. He said, I, I wouldn't do that. I'd do this. Or he was about five years ahead of me. And so having great mentors and taking your first job where you will get great mentors makes all the difference in the world. And, um, and then wake up every day and be grateful you get to do what you do and have a lot of fun of doing it. If you're not having fun doing this, then it's really not that it's not worth doing. So I wake up every day feeling lucky and, um, and I have fun doing it. And it's because of, I have great residents to mentor. I have uh, senior faculty that help mentor me and, um, and I get to take care of patients, which is a dream come true for me from coming from a non-physician family. Now, I know you briefly touched on it, but what advice do you have for the graduating chief residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? I would say to not think conventionally, to be a disruptional thinker. I think people have a mindset. They may be married. They may have kids. They have a mindset of where they have to be in life, what they have to make for a living. And I, I, um, I had a a wife that didn't think like that. And she was like, let's try something crazy and different. Let's do, and, and I think you've got to be willing to move anywhere in the country for the best opportunity. And it may not even look like a great opportunity, but maybe it has good bones, or maybe the people that'll mentor you are going to make you a superstar, or perhaps you have passion for what they're doing there. Um, you know, everything's about timing. And if you're a vascular neurosurgeon or a spine surgeon and they need you, I always argue, go to the place that needs you the most because that would be the fastest place to build a practice is not where you're the seventh spine guy in, in, in the group or, you know, uh, the fifth vascular guy, but if someone offered you an opportunity in a place in the country you weren't going to normally go to, then you weren't thinking of, and it is an amazing opportunity, then think outside the box and take it. Because often your first job isn't your last job. You know, neurosurgeons have a way of changing jobs, and you you have the ability uh, after you get to a certain level to go to the next level. And every five years, I always tell people, reinvent yourself. Think of different things. Think of original ideas of how you can change and get better and be a better neurosurgeon. Now, on that thought process, basically everything right now is being done virtually, even including the national conferences. So what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process? You know, I I think um, instead of looking at this as a deficit, you know, Sir William Osler in 1931 told told the students you'll never have what we have we reinvented medicine we reinvented medical school i think this is going to be the most resilient class of neurosurgeons that are graduating i have great hope for them i mean they have survived a pandemic it it, it last one was 100 years ago and i think that they're they're so savvy with the media and, and, and that kind of communication, they're gonna figure it out. Now, I understand that there are not as many jobs as there usually are. Um, and that's why I encourage my graduates to think of places that you wouldn't think of before. Um, but I think this is an incredible opportunity that is, is building in a resilience to this generation of neurosurgeons that's gonna be far beyond anything that came before. So I'm really hopeful for this growth. Now, being a neurosurgeon, a lot of people think that you guys are superheroes, but there's also a human element to being this type of doctor. And what type of advice would you have given your younger self when dealing with complications or issues in the OR that weren't as favorable as you determined? You know, uh, the thing that I learned, 
and I was lucky. Um, first of all, you, you know, you learn humility from your complications and you're going to have them. I don't care how good you think you are. And, you know, when you graduate and you're a chief resident, you think you're Superman. But in fact, after your first three complications, you can, it's very easy to be humble. And again, it goes back to the question you asked before. I think it's why you surround yourself with great people and mentors. Um, the best thing I do that I can do for my junior faculty is when they have a bad complication, sit down with them and get them back on the horse and get them back doing what they're doing and saying, what would you have done differently so this doesn't happen again? And not assess, blame and criticize but tell them, hey, think differently on the next one. And so the advice I give my younger self is to, to, to take it down a notch and be more self-reflective about what happened to you. And, and don't, and one of the things is I was fortunate I had mentors, so I never lost the edge or the courage to go forward. I was smart enough to learn from the dumb things that I did and not do them again. But believe me, I'm, you know, I've been doing this for over 30 years and I'm still, and I'm making new mistakes. So um, the idea that when you get to a certain level, you won't make mistakes anymore is not true. You just make different dumb mistakes or you lose attention to detail. And, um, and I think that we're in a constant, process of learning and relearning and I tell my younger self this is going to happen to you for the rest of your life so deal with it okay and get better every single time you make a mistake thing that I would most like to emphasize is bad things are going to happen you know the resilience thing I think that they need to know that bad things can happen to you and you know going you know I was like one of the only people that were in the military at the time. And I'm thinking, okay, my career is over. That's it. It's the end. I'm in the army. How can I ever have an academic or private practice career? And in fact, when I reflect back, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me because of the leadership. It taught me leadership. I was around, at, you know, um, Colin Powell was one of my commanders, to give you an example. When you're exposed to people like that, even though he's not in my field now, I still get inspiration. Uh, General Chiarelli commanded in Iraq when I was, in, I mean, these are people larger than life that got there simply because they had a skill set. And that skill set uh, is really translatable, whether you go into neurological surgery or you go into politics or, some, or something else. I would tell people not to be discouraged. You are going to fail at something, okay? But get inspired, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep moving forward and not backward. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.